Hi everyone, I'm Matt Farrell from Undecided with Matt Farrell, and I'm thrilled to be partnering with Student Energy for this Energy 101 segment on cities and rising energy consumption. Cities are global hubs of communication, commerce, culture, and you guessed it, energy consumption. Covering only 3% of the Earth's surface, cities are responsible for up to 80% of the world's energy consumption and 75% of carbon emissions, and that's growing. By 2050, more than two-thirds of the world's population is expected to live in urban areas. That's up from 55% today. Cities are home to the world's richest and poorest communities, who have vastly unequal ecological and carbon footprints. As the world continues to urbanize, it's becoming increasingly important to consider exactly what impact cities have on the planet and why they might have a unique ability to catalyze bold climate action. But how are cities responsible for so much of the world's carbon emissions and energy use? Well, we can break that down into two categories, direct emissions and embedded emissions. A city's direct emissions are largely a result of energy use in the city and fall into one of three things. Electricity and fuel use in residential and commercial buildings, road transportation, particularly cars and trucks, electricity used for heating and cooling. And this one's especially important to watch because as global temperatures increase, energy use for things like air conditioning are also set to increase. The direct emissions produced within cities is not just a climate problem. It's a health problem. Nine in 10 people living in urban areas breathe polluted air, and the World Health Organization estimates that over six million premature deaths per year are attributable to air pollution. This is more than the deaths from malaria, HIV AIDS, and tuberculosis combined. There's an economic case for reducing direct urban emissions too. Multiple studies have shown that investing in low carbon energy policies like retrofits, clean energy, and sustainable buildings would result in lower energy bills for both households and commercial buildings. While it's critical to look at a city's direct energy consumption and carbon emissions, a large part of why cities are responsible for so much of the world's emissions are because of the carbon emissions embedded in the food and products that urban dwellers consume, often from all over the world. Building on the ecological footprint concept developed by researchers William Reese and Mathis Wackernagel, researchers have found that most of the world's cities have an ecological footprint many times the size of their actual city boundaries. As demand within cities increases for carbon-intensive products like meat and dairy, or bigger cars, vast amounts of land, water, and energy and other natural resources are required to sustain growing consumption. It just happens to be somewhere else. So to address the climate crisis, cities will have to reduce their overall consumption of energy and natural resources while ensuring its residents have access to good quality of life. Luckily, cities are primed for bold climate action. So let's break down some of the ways that cities can pilot innovative climate solutions. The first, to tackle emissions from electricity use. We need to first consider where energy can be conserved. By designing more sustainable buildings, incentivizing retrofits, updating building codes, and enforcing energy efficiency standards, cities can reduce demand for electricity. Cities also have a lot of power in phasing out fossil fuels on a large scale. In fact, over 1,300 cities, which are home to over a billion people, have set targets to boost renewable energy while nearly 50 cities have enforced complete or partial bans on fossil fuels. Second, density is one of the biggest strengths for a city in fighting climate change. By building dense, walkable communities with affordable public transportation and grocery stores, schools, and businesses close to people's homes, we can reduce the number of cars on the road, reduce urban sprawl, and design our communities around people and green spaces rather than cars. Fewer fossil fuel burning cars will also have the added benefit of reducing air pollution while increasing urban green space provides essential natural cooling that counters the urban heat island effect. Third, cities have a unique potential to shift consumption patterns to reduce their overall carbon and ecological footprints. And here's the reason why. They tend to have closer relationships with the small businesses, community groups, and grassroots organizations in the city who are some of the most important players in helping to advocate for and shape the culture and lifestyle of the city's residents. For example, climate policies that support a shift to plant-based diets and reduced food waste would be more equitable and more effectively implemented when bolstered by policies and community-level initiatives that increase food access for low-income residents, investments in community-led food justice initiatives, and opportunities for small businesses and community organizations to participate in the transition. Making all of these shifts to transportation systems, food systems, and energy systems will be a big challenge but it could pay off for residents in multiple ways. Just investing in energy efficiency and building upgrades alone could generate anywhere from two to 16 million jobs annually. And depending on the city, while investing in public transport and vehicle efficiency could bring even more millions of jobs. 
So to review, we've explored why cities have a footprint that extends far beyond their own internal operations and energy use. They consume land, water, and natural resources from all over the world through the food and products that they use. This means the responsibility of cities is not only to decarbonize their own buildings, transportation, and businesses, but to consider how to reduce their negative impacts on natural ecosystems, rural communities, and indigenous lands far outside their political boundaries. We've also explored how cities can have the potential to kickstart decarbonization and accelerate the sustainable energy transition. They can lead the way even when national climate commitments and international negotiations progress slowly. The large concentration of people in cities, particularly young people, means we can organize effectively and in large numbers to take decisive action and build more sustainable, equitable communities. <laughs>